Welcome to Brady Lane Worship Online. I'm Leanna Atwell. Joining me today are Cheryl Fletcher, Vicki Maris, Derek Coleman, and Scott Greason. We'll be taking communion together at the end of our worship time. Our senior pastor, Jeff Keller, will invite us to partake together. Today, I'd like to share with you from Colossians 3:16. In that, we find this command. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So we invite you to join us in singing today and bring your kids because we're going to kick off a kid's song again today. Oh, 
It's time for us to enter into our time of communion. If you have your elements, please gather them at this time. We will partake of the emblems together as directed. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a piece of unleavened bread and he broke it and he passed it amongst his disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body. You may partake of the bread. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it amongst his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. You may partake of the cup. May God bless our communing with him today. Hello everyone out there joining us today online. We welcome you to the Brady Lane Church family. If you would like to connect with us, you can do so by going to our website and opening up the link on the guest card page. Fill out that form and it will come straight to our office. That will help us get to know you better and get you connected to our church family. We are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. As revealed earlier this past week, we have started into our plan to return to church. But we are still a few weeks away from allowing folks to worship in person with us here at the church. As we are trying to be responsible and do right by you all as we can. But when we return, we hope that you will join us here. Just one word of caution, though. We are going to require everyone to wear pants to worship. We know you have gotten comfortable watching and worshiping in your PJs, but we will hope that everyone will get back into the swing of things wearing clothes when we come to worship in person. Amy and I joked about that this week. We thought it would be hilarious if everyone came to church that first week wearing their pajamas with a cup of coffee and a breakfast sandwich in their hands. It has been and continues to be an interesting time. In fact, as many of you are watching this, Amy and I will be traveling down to Crawfordsville for a social distance appropriate visit with our mothers. It will be weirdly awesome to totally devote my day to my mother, my mother-in-law, and wife to honor them for being moms. I don't know that I will ever have this opportunity again. Before I get into the message today, I would like to share a video tribute to our moms everywhere. Enjoy. Well, we certainly want to wish all of our moms a very special day today. As we move on to our message, our 316 passage for today, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 3. Our 316 for today, out of context, makes very little sense. But in its context, the entirety of chapter 3 it is a powerful bit of Scripture. And we're going to look at the entire chapter 3 together. But before I read, I want to share with you what is happening in Israel at the time that this was written. Israel had just endured a bitter civil war, which split the nation into two separate kingdoms. The northern kingdom 
which would be known as Israel, and the southern kingdom, which would be called Judah. Because their attentions had been turned on fighting one another, their enemies had moved in on them from all around, each one preparing to pounce on this weakened and divided nation. The people of Israel and Judah were so enamored with themselves, reveling in their prosperity, as both kingdoms were very wealthy, and were pretty much doing whatever they wanted to do. They were doing great, except for one thing. They had completely forgotten God. And now here comes the prophet Isaiah, sent by God to get their attention, to say, hey Israel, hey there Judah, you are all messing up. And God is warning them that he is about to pull back his blessings that he had been bestowing on the people, and in turn, evil will enter where God once was. Why would God allow that evil to enter in, we might ask? Well, it's very clear, because the people had forgotten him. Isaiah is saying, we have brought injustice on ourselves because we have pulled away from the very one who brings the justice. A couple of things we need to know about justice before we get into the text today. Justice is part of God's nature. The very nature of God contains justice, rightness, righteousness. God is just, and it is his nature to be just. But also, justice is something we naturally desire because we are made in God's image. We naturally covet justice. We long for justice. It's because it's built into our human nature by God himself. Let's jump into our text for today, Isaiah 3, starting in verse 1. See now, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the man of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman, and clever enchanter. In this first section of the text, Isaiah is simply saying, Judah, I'm going to withhold my blessings from you. All the stuff that I have been giving you, all the blessings, all the supply, all the stockpiles, all of the power, all of the fame, all of the excess, I'm going to strip it away because you have forgotten God. It could be easy to get all judgy against the people of Judah here, but if we are honest and we look around our wonderful country, haven't we as a nation also forgotten God? Not only have we as a nation forgotten him, but our nation has vehemently and purposefully removed him from our midst. No prayer in public, no prayer in schools, God's name taken from official meetings. The famous vernacular in God we trust is being removed from public view. God's commandments removed from courtrooms and courthouse lawns, and it's just gotten started, folks. We have not just forgotten God, we have allowed mere humans to attack God's character and remove reminders of him from our midst. And hasn't it felt a little like God has begun to pull away from us? Hasn't it looked or felt like God has begun to withdraw his blessings on our nation? Can you see the similarities? Now please don't hear me saying we should march and riot and cause chaos and plunder until someone surrenders to our demands to put God back into things that he's been removed from. But what I am saying is much like Judah, believers, we haven't done a whole lot. We've silently stood by as humanity's evil has waged an assault on the God of the universe. We've stood by and remained silent which is just as bad as those who have attacked, attacked God's character themselves. We have bought into the lie that America is too big and too good to fail and disappear as many other nations have before us. And God is watching. Let's continue on in the text, starting in verse 4. 
I will make mere youths their officials. Children will rule over them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old and the nobody against the honored. A man will seize one of his brothers in his father's house and say, you have a cloak, you be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. In this section of the text, Isaiah is saying that there is going to be oppression coming from even the young. Bad leaders are going to emerge. Young people are going to rise up against the old. People are going to be put into office and leadership positions that they don't deserve. And they will be given the keys to a broken system. This is what was happening in Israel. But again, doesn't it sound familiar in some ways? Aren't we already arriving in a similar place? We have seen that there are many unfit leaders in many places, not only in the federal and local governments of our country, but around the world. But this isn't just about other countries or even our own government. God here is directly pointing at his people. And the leaders who were being chosen for God's people were not God's choice. They were putting whoever looked the part into the place of leadership. The leaders were not godly, and therefore they ran the nation of Israel into the ground. Folks, this is still applicable to us today in the church. When leaders are unjust, everyone under them suffers. Christian leaders, we're going to be held doubly accountable, not to people, but to God. Corruption will bring God's wrath. Let's look at the text. Verse 7. But in that day he will cry out, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. Jerusalem staggers. Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Injustice is an attack upon God's children. Those who try to remain right will be attacked by those who love wickedness. Those who try to live right will be challenged by those who love their sin. Those who try to pad their pride or love self more than they love others are bringing their weapons to bear on the cause of Christ. And folks, we like to think we are the children of God in that statement, but I have to caution us to think deeply. Are we? Or are we by default working more on the side of the attackers? Do I even have to make comparisons here? Do we not parade our sins proudly before God justifying our sin, claiming it's just who we are? And before those of you who are feeling self-righteous start swelling up, we all need to look in the mirror and note the sin that we flaunt in our lives. And we all have some. Now I want to skip verses 10 and 11 and come back to them at the end of the message. And you will see why in a bit. But let's continue on in verse 12 through the end. Youths oppress my people. Women rule over them. My people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. The Lord takes his place in the court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The Lord says the women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and headbands and crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and anklets and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, 
the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes of their cloaks, the purses and mirrors and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. Instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. When we do nothing to help the oppressed, we become one with the oppressors. Justice will come for those who remain righteous. That's the hope that we find in our text for today. But the 316 text helps us to understand something, and it's directed specifically at the women in this text because of what the women in Judea and Jerusalem were doing. But I think it's applicable to both men and women as we look at it today. Worship of self brings judgment and curses upon yourself. When we worship ourselves, when we put all of our effort and all of our thought and all of our money and all of our pride and all of our everything into taking care of and pleasing ourselves, God's promised here that he will bring judgment and curses upon us. We need to understand that we need to use what we have to help others. Now let's get back to verses 10 and 11, as I said I would, because they end up being our main point of Isaiah's message. In verses 10 and 11, Isaiah writes, Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked! Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. This main point that Isaiah is bringing, and it's the main point that we need to understand from this text today. If we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. But if we hunger and thirst for self-adulation, it's going to bring down God's righteous judgment upon us. I brought this up last week. Is God maybe trying to get our attention? Is what we are going through as a nation, as a world, maybe a warning from God that he has had just about enough of the injustice that we continue to parade before him and call choice, acceptance, political correctness, social justice, one world? They all sound like good words, but in reality, our embracing of them is truly separating us from the justice God wants to give us. I implore you today, we all need to set self aside. We need to look for ways to do good for others. We need to look for opportunities to sacrifice self for the good of another person. I encourage you to practice those things today. We need to get back to a place where we are less concerned about self and more focused on loving God and loving others. We need to believe, we need to live, and we need to connect. Believing in God, living for God, and connecting other people to God. Will you join me in this endeavor this week? As we take more steps toward coming back together, let us take time, this time that we have left separated, to work on our connections and relationships with lost people so that we might serve them and love them enough that they might see God in us. Will you please, will you please pray with me? Father God, we come before you today and we thank you for this day. It is a day that you have made. And we rejoice and we are glad in it. Father, we thank you for this message of warning. It was a message of warning to the Israelites that they needed to get right with you, that they were heading in a very bad direction. 
Unfortunately, Father, we know from history, from reading the rest of the Old Testament, that Israel did not turn away from their wicked ways. And they continued to flaunt their sin before you. They continued to do things that were not in your will. And you brought judgment upon them in the form of attacking and conquering countries who either destroyed or took Israel away as slaves. Father, we approach a similar time now where we feel like we have everything under control and we are trying to do everything on our own and we have pulled away from you as a nation. And Father, I think in some ways, even as a church, as your people, we have pulled away from you, trying to do things on our own. Father, let us turn away from our wicked ways. Let us quit flaunting our sin and instead help us to push ourselves to eradicate the sin in our lives. We know we are no longer guilty of our sin if we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and we have that hope and that promise. But Father, we also have been told many times to sin no more, to wipe that sin out of our lives and not continue to embrace it. Father, help us, guide us, direct us in these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this brings us to the end of our time together today. May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his light to shine upon you and grant you peace this week. We announced earlier this week on Thursday that we are beginning our process of reopening. Beginning next Sunday, we will move our start time to where you can start viewing the worship service to 11 a.m. Sunday, May 17th. Sunday, May 24th, and every Sunday from this point forward, we will air our services live on YouTube Live based on our YouTube channel for Brady Lane Church beginning at 11 a.m. We're excited about this new technology. We're excited to be able to bring our worship services to our neighbors, uh, to our community in a live format. Uh, while we're continuing to be away from the church, uh, we encourage you to continue to join us at 11 a.m. for these next two Sundays. We will still have no uh, congregation here at the church. We're going to continue to ask everyone to worship from home. Beginning May 31st, we will begin having a limited attendance worship service, meaning that we will have no more than 100 people in each of our two services and we're going to continue to ask to those who are at risk to stay home so that we can stay under that number of 100 that has been prescribed by the state. We will do that for a couple of weeks and then we will let you know what will come after that. We do want to let you know starting May 31st that we will not have any children's ministry activities going on. So you, if you are a parent, of children you need to begin preparing that if you do come to church on those Sundays your children will be with you in the worship area again we are doing that to take our time bringing everything back um, so we would encourage those of you especially those with small children or infants to continue to stay home and worship with us online just to protect your family and protect your kiddos we want them to stay safe we will bring more information to you on our continued movement toward reopening at a later date. That date will be May 21st, 2020, 7 p.m. And you will find that on our YouTube channel. We hope that you're doing well. We love you and we can't wait to see you in person. And we can finally say that those days uh, are growing shorter uh, rather than longer. We'll talk to you soon. God bless you.